Hello again, this is Barry Shaw, and this is The View from Israel. I'm going to promise you a spectacular show today because I have a very special, unique guest. I'd like to introduce you to Avner Abraham, the creator of Spy Legends. Welcome to The View from Israel, Avner. Thank you for being my guest today. Thank you very now, much. I want to tell our viewers that uh, Avner has served... Um, uh, high ranking in the IDF, and he served 20 years in the service of the Mossad, the famous Israeli spy agency. Uh, I don't believe I can extract too much information from Avner because if he tells me any secrets, he's duty bound to kill me. But so we'll uh, get over that part. And I'd like, uh, in your words, Avner, please tell us something about your career in the Mossad as much as you can. Well, first of all, it was 28 years in the Mossad, and uh, I retired seven years ago. Uh, now I'm 57 years old. I'm seven years retired. Uh, most of my life I was in the IDF and in the Mossad, and uh, my first meeting with the Mossad was in Lebanon, in a very in a beautiful city north of Beirut. I worked with the Mossad as a soldier without uniform. And uh, then it was um, uh, very normal to join the Mossad immediately after the military service. And I'm, I'm, I'm very happy. It was very interesting to travel the world more than 10 years uh, uh, in uh, more than 40 different countries. And uh, I'm happy and proud. Very good. Um Skipping through uh, your your history with the Mossad, one of the things I, I want you on the show for, because we're heading for something very interesting, you became the creator of the Mossad Museum, which is housed in the offices of the Mossad. Tell us how you became suddenly the creator of this uh, museum. So uh, let's start with the fact that I, I didn't like history. I didn't like to read the history books. But I'm crazy about old stuff, old objects. I'm a collector. And from the first day when I came to the Mossad, I started to collect original objects from uh, famous operations. It can start uh, uh, from uh, guns, uh, go through cameras, maps, and uh, whatever you think about spy gadgets. And I used to make small exhibitions in the Mossad headquarters until the day, the big day, 10 years ago, actually 11 years ago, I made a small exhibition about the capture of Adolf Eichmann uh, with all the original stuff from the operation. And uh, suddenly the, the Prime Minister Netanyahu came to the Mossad headquarters for a meeting. He saw the exhibit and he said, I want you to come to the parliament, to the Knesset in Jerusalem, and I want you to show this exhibit. And it was the first uh, day of my Hollywood life. It's interesting. Now, um, you told me a story of um, originally um, the museum, it wasn't a museum, you were keeping some of the uh, artifacts belonged to the Mossad and you kept, you were told to keep it down in the Mossad basement, but they needed to use the basement. And this is where it was brought up from the basement. Tell, tell me the story, tell our viewers a story in your own words. Well, uh... As you know, um, we don't have uh, extra rooms in uh, in any big organization. You, you always need the space for, for the employee. So uh, I decided to start my uh, exhibitions in the Mossad uh, basement uh, that used also for, uh, you know, as a sh shelter against uh, missiles from Gaza. And one day they told me, hey, you have to remove everything because we have these missiles from Gaza and we need a place for the employees. All the agents need to protect themselves. So I decided to move everything to the main lobby. And no one, I didn't ask permission. I just decided to make a, 
a small gallery in the in the main lobby of the main building and uh, people uh, saw that it's very normal to show uh, spy exhibitions and after the big success of operation finale the chief of mossad uh, tamir pardo uh, asked me to uh, to create and to build a museum for the mossad so it was my last job three years before i retired to build a museum I understand the museum isn't open for the public, uh, which is sad because I think the public would be fascinated by it. Um, let me come on to something you just mentioned, Operation Finale. Um, you have a lot of the original and up till now fairly secret information and documents uh, in your archives relating to the capture of Adolf Eichmann. Um, can you tell us about um, both Operation Finale, the movie, and also uh, the documents that you have and the uh, evidence and information that's really not been shared by the public? Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is probably going to be the first time you're going to hear some information regarding the capture of Eichmann you've never heard before. Go ahead, Abner. So uh, I'm proud to be the world expert in the story of the capture of Eichmann because uh, I spent years in the Mossad archive and I met almost everyone that I could meet all over the world. In, uh, in Germany, in South America, especially in Argentina, uh, I met, uh, I met a few of the Mossad agents that took part in the operation. And I met also the, the second and the third generation. And every time they find suddenly a passport or a picture or a, or a camera and people, people send me from all over the world all the time, almost every week, I get uh, email with the new information about the capture of Eichmann. Uh, I don't, I have my private collection, my private ar archive. It's uh, things that I collected and uh, I bought also in auctions everything that related to Eichmann. But uh, my main exhibit is now in the state, Operation Finale. Uh, I traveled uh, uh, before the corona for almost five years. And I show this huge exhibit, 5,000 square feet, in the most, uh, uh, in, in the biggest and most important Holocaust museums in the state. Uh, including the Jewish Heritage Museum in, ba in uh, Battery Park, Manhattan, New York, uh, the World War II Museum in New Orleans, and uh, more uh, Holocaust museums like in Skokie, Chicago, uh, Houston, Texas, Detroit, Florida, and more museums. And the secrets of uh, my exhibit is the fact that for the first time the Mossad decided to show the original stuff from the for operation. I mean, it started from a regular flight ticket. You remember the flight ticket? Uh, cameras, fake car license plates, fake passports, and uh, documents, uh, even the keys, Eichmann's keys to his house. And, um, and also we decided when we came to the state that it's not enough to talk about the capture of Eichmann. In Israel, it's enough to say capture of Eichmann. Everybody knows who's, who was Eichmann. But in the state, you have to start from the beginning and talk about the Nazis and the war and the final solution and even what and even the trial and what happened after the, the trial. Uh, that's why we, we needed to, be, to rebuild the, 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 this uh, exhibit. Uh, I, you also became the consultant for the Hollywood movie Operation Finale with the British actor Ben Kingsley playing the role of Adolf Eichmann. Um, tell us about how they reached out to you to be the consultant and your experience on the movie set. Okay, so first of all, it was great to work with Ben Kingsley, Oscar Isaac, and especially with the Chris White, the director. And uh, Matthew Orton, uh, the British guy that wrote the script for this uh, a great uh, film. Uh, 
but it was too late for me because I, I found out about this uh, when they, they already started uh, to, uh, to find the actors and to almost start shooting the film. But uh, I, I tried to, to change some, some, some things in the, in, the, in the film because it's a, it's a feature movie, it's not a documentary. And uh, I have uh, the whole lecture about uh, the difference between the real story, the true story, and the film. But I still think that the fact that Hollywood, Hollywood decided to make uh, a movie about the capture of Eichmann, and most of the people that saw and people that will see this uh, film would not be Jewish, would be people from all over the world, even Muslims. I know that people in Tehran also so this uh, film, and it's important to talk about uh, the Holocaust in a creative way. When people going to the cinema to watch a spy film, but at the end of the day, they learn about the Nazis. So I was a consultant. I was in Argentina uh, more than two months, and uh, I, had, I have a lot of uh, stories behind the scenes. I, I'm also playing cameo in the film. Um, so if we go if we go from the uh, the movie to actual reality, the work of the Mossad, in order to discover the location of Adolf Eichmann, um, I understand that there were a couple of uh, German important Germans who played some sort of role in leading the Mossad to the actual location. I'm talking here about uh, Luther Hermann and Fritz Bauer. What can you tell us about the connection? between these two Germans and uh, the Mossad and Eichmann's uh, whereabouts? So, uh, so uh, Lothar Hermann was a half Christian and half Jew, Holocaust survivor uh, from uh, Dachau. Uh, he escaped from uh, Germany and he came to South America. Uh, his daughter one day came uh, home with her new friend, a new boyfriend. And when he introduced himself, he said, my name is Klaus Eichmann. And you can guess it was Eichmann's son. He, he realized that Eichmann's son is dating his daughter, half Jewish daughter. And he decided to send this information uh, to the Jewish, by the way, prosecutor in uh, Frankfurt. Dr. Fritz Bauer, also Holocaust survivor, by the way. And Bauer, at the end of the day, sent this information uh, to the Israeli delegation in Cologne. And from the, de from the Israeli delegation, uh, they sent this information to the Mossad. And uh, the Mossad uh, uh, sent an agent to check the information. But uh, let's, let's say that the biggest Two heroes in this story is Lothar Hermann and uh, Fritz Bauer. Because of them, the Mossad could uh, capture Eichmann. Yeah, I understand though that the Mossad acting on the tip box into the information went to one address, but it turned out that it wasn't the address that Eichmann was living at the time. He was living close by in another location, but the fact that he came back with the wrong address sort of um, put, poured water on, on the hunt for Heitman. What can you tell us about that aspect, about the location, and actually tracking down the, the house where they actually lived? Well, it, it wasn't a wrong address. It was a previous address. So when the Mossad came, uh, the Eichmann's family already escaped to the new uh, address, the, the Garibaldi Street like the famous book, The House in Garibaldi Street. So they lived, before Garibaldi, they lived in Olivos, in Chacabuco Street. Uh, by the way, the house is still exists. Uh, exist. I was there a few years ago, and uh, uh, we will see, uh, we will see the, the picture of the house in uh, uh, Chacabuco Street. Uh, so the Mossad agent, Aroni, when he came to Argentina, he needed to to uh, relocate uh, the Eichmann's family, and uh, and he could uh, do it when when he came to the empty uh, house in Chacabuco, uh, he spoke with the two law um, uh, 
people that walk, two walkers that uh, uh, walks in the apartment, in the empty apartment, and they told him uh, that one of the kids that walk in the garage next door uh, is uh, um, a family member of uh, Eichmann, and uh, the Mossad followed this guy uh, with, with the motorcycle, and they they found the, the house in Garibaldi Street. At the end of that time, of course, Eichmann wasn't living there under his own name. He was using the name Clements, I believe. Yeah, he used the name Ricardo Clement. By the way, he got a fake passport from the Vatican in Italy. Um, not only him, thousands of uh, Nazis got help from the Vatican, and they could, could use this fake identity to enter uh, to South America, mostly to Argentina. If you go today to Argentina, there is a cities, a German cities. You cannot enter there. But that's interesting. You told me that the Vatican actually provided Adolf Eichmann with a false passport in a, in a different name. Yes, he gave him the name Ricardo Clement, and he uh, escaped from 90, uh, on, on 1950 from Italy. He came with a ship from Italy to uh, Argentina. And uh, his family, the wife and three kids, joined him after two years on 52. But they uh, they came with the uh, from the main door with the with the real names with the Eichmann. They just uh, changed a little bit one of the letters Ishman instead of Eichmann. But they couldn't change uh, uh, and use fake passports for all. Uh, the kids and the, uh, the wife. You know, it's, it's very easy to give a fake passport to one person, but if you want to give it to the whole family, uh, and uh, it's, it's, so it's, it's very, very, uh, it's not easy, okay? So, so, so the secrets or the fact that the Mossad could capture Eichmann came from the idea that the family didn't change the name, and they continued to use the name Eichmann. And by the way, Eichmann, during the war, the, the, the war used to say that it's uh, important first to kill the Jewish kids, to kill the next generation. And uh, the Mossad captured him because of his son, because of the family that used the same name Eichmann in Argentina. Now, uh, I don't want to disclose, uh, uh, disclose your exact location of where you live, where you have your office, um, because again, you might have to kill me after this and we have to delete the video, but uh, you live not far from Hurt Sleepy Top. Tell us about the role that the Sharon Hotel play in Hurt Sleepy Top plays in the story, because I think some of the people watching this have probably even stayed at that hotel. Okay, so the Sharon Hotel is, uh, is not so fancy, uh, is not so uh, special, but it's an old hotel in Herzliya, and uh, there is a lot of spy uh, stories that related to this uh, hotel. Uh, we will talk about it in the future, about Idi Amin Dada, the president of uh, Uganda and the Operation Entebbe. But uh, on uh, 59, uh, Fritz Bauer, the prosecutor, came from Germany, and he met the chief of Mossad and a few Mossad agents in uh, Sharon Hotel in Herzliya. He came with additional information. He came with the picture of Eichmann, and he came with uh, a new details about the name and uh, the name Ricardo Clement. He came with the name Ricardo Clement, and he told the Mossad, don't, don't uh, uh, try to locate Eichmann. Try to locate Ricardo Clement. This is the false identity that Eichmann used. So it was also a big help for the Mossad. It was additional information. And by the way, there is a lot of uh, news around the world from the last year that uh, the main source was a German guy. It's not true. It's not true. The main source of our story was the love story between the half Jewish girl and Eichmann's son the daughter of Lothar Herman. Interesting, interesting. What could you tell us um, about the actual capture and removal from Argentina secretly um, 
we saw the movie, but maybe you can share with us one or two little anecdotes of the, the what really happened there. How did you, how was he captured? How was he managed to be uh, secreted basically out of uh, Argentina? Well, we are talking about 1960. It's uh, 15 years after the war, the end of the war. I think that he didn't uh, uh, try to hide himself and uh, he got a routine. And you know, if you want to be spy one day, it's not too late. You have to find a routine. You have to find the routine of the person that you want to capture. And if you see that he's coming, for example, uh, Eichmann used to come every day uh, at uh, 7.30 p.m. Uh, he worked for Mercedes as a manager and uh, he came with bus number two or three. And uh, the Mossad team decided to wait for him uh, near the bus station. And so, so it was very easy. They came with two cars and uh, waiting for him. Of course, uh, in the same day, he got something at work and he came late, but they decided to wait for him. He came a few minutes after 8 p.m. They captured him, they took him to the safe house, they questioned him, and uh, when they questioned him, they undressed him, cover, covered his eyes and asked him a routine questions like, uh, what is the, the color of your hair? What is the color of your eyes? The size of your shoes? And suddenly they asked him, what is your Nazi ID number? And they gave him an order like a Nazi officer. What is your number? And he gave the right num the, the number, the real number, because he gave it automatically. He didn't think about uh, using a different number. He just gave the real number. And uh, he said, yes, I'm Adolf Eichmann, and I would like a glass of red wine. Red wine? Red and I suppose wine. you served him red wine, or was it water? Well, well, they got a, 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 a kiddush, a Jewish kiddush wine, and they gave him a glass of wine. And uh, it was a it was a big success because at the beginning they uh, they knew that he is probably Nazi, but uh, uh, the main uh, goal is to bring uh, Eichmann. Because Eichmann, we cannot say something good about Eichmann. The only thing that was good is the fact that he was a good example, a good example for the trial. Because he was in charge of all the trains and schedule and uh, Eichmann's trial was very wide. They spoke about all the, most of the camps, most of the places. And uh, that's why it was it was uh, better than uh, finding a uh, a small Nazi that was a guard in a small camp. What I wanted so, to ask you about, about the uh, extraction from Argentina is that uh, he wasn't sort of smuggled out on some private, uh, covert private plane. He was put on a proper airline, as, as a, not just a passenger, but he was always like a dressed him up with the story. I understand as a member of the flight team on a commercial aircraft. What can you tell us about how he was delivered past the Argentinian authorities onto the plane itself? Well, uh, it was like a private plane because El Al don't fly to Argentina even today. The Mossad asked El Al uh, to publish and to make announcement about a new lovely destination, Buenos Aires. And the Mossad sponsored uh, this flight. Mossad agents bought all the tickets to this flight. And uh, it was almost empty plan when they flew to Argentina. So they decided to take a delegation, a special delegation headed by Abba Ibn to celebrate with the Argent uh, Argentinian government uh, the 150 years anniversary. 
And and uh, it's funny that Abba even the head of the delegation didn't know that he is a part of all this fake delegation. He really thought that he was a minister without portfolio and he thought that he is a part of a very special mission. So El Al landed in Argentina and the Mossad smuggled him to the airport, smuggled Eichmann to the airport as a Sikh crew member. They took him directly to the plane and all the rest is history. So you're telling us that Abba Iban flew on with Adolf Eichmann on the plane from Argentina to Israel? No. Uh, Adolf, uh, no, Abba even and the, the Israeli delegation flew with El Al, but unfortunately they found that uh, the El Al plane disappeared after 24 hours with Eichmann. Well, they didn't know about Eichmann at the beginning, but uh, the plane disappeared and they needed to, to find the commercial flights and come back from uh, Europe to Israel. But uh, of course, we know the Ben Gurion uh, announcement on uh, that he made in the Knesset uh, on May 23rd, 1960. Uh, it was too early, by the way, uh, because uh, we missed Mengele because of this. But uh, when Ben Gurion made his announcement that Eichmann is in Israel, it was uh, after a few days they knew that he was in Argentina and. Uh, the Argentinian government decided to send our ambassador home as a persona non grata. Mm. Is there any information that uh, we were able to extract from Eichmann when he was in prison here in Israel before and during his trial, or was he closed lipped? Well, uh, most of the investigation, the Israeli police uh, established a special unit, o, Bureau 06, <clears throat> that questioned Eichmann, but the, most of the information came from uh, the 14 uh, different officers that uh, each one of them was in charge of a different area in Europe, and they needed to find uh, witnesses that agree to talk. Most of the Holocaust survivors didn't want to talk. They didn't talk with the second generation. And uh, the mission was also to find documents, pictures, maps, everything. So the main information came from the investigation, from the special unit, not from Eichmann. He used to say I was a small cog in the machine and uh, they told me what to say. I was part of it, of the machine, but he was the machine. And what could you tell us about the trial itself, which of course was the most public trial, I suppose, ever. Eichmann on trial in uh, Jerusalem. I understand as a result of that uh, trial, or at the end of the trial, you have a very special uh, exhibit that goes into your Operation Finale exhibition. Tell us about that aspect. Well, the fact that Operation Filani is uh, so important is the connection to the trial, the famous Eichmann's trial. You couldn't make this uh, trial without capturing Eichmann and bringing him to Israel. And uh, it was a, a turning point for the state of Israel and for the people uh, all over the world uh, the fact that uh, the state of Israel made a trial and uh, for the first time they decided to open the whole story to write the book of the Holocaust. And it was also a turning point for the families. Suddenly the Holocaust survivors that were victims, they uh, suddenly could speak and because all the Tzabas in Israel told them, why didn't you fight? Why didn't you fight against the Nazis? And um, for the first time, it was a televised trial in Europe and also in the state, not in Israel. In Israel, they started with the television only on 68, a few years after. 
And um, Ben Gurion, I mean, most of the people ask me why the Mossad didn't try to find and kill all the Nazis, but the Mossad uh, got only one uh, manager, is the, is the prime minister, is the direct manager of the Mossad. And Ben Gurion didn't want to spend time or to put uh, people in risk and to spend money by fighting Nazi. He decided that he will make one trial, one big trial, and he will talk about everything, and he will close this idea, this issue, and he will move forward. And if you look at the Demyanyuk trial, if you try to compare it, you, you will find that he was right. Because the Demyanyuk trial was very, was ridiculous. And uh, the Mossad made also a few operations to kill Nazis. One of them was in uh, South America, in uh, uh, Montevideo, uh, by killing uh, the hangman from Riga, Tsukus. And there's also a, a few other uh, examples. And the Mossad, of course, tried to find Mengele. And uh, if you want, I can, I can talk a little bit about Mengele. I'd like you to do that, and uh, while you're doing so, can you tell us if there were uh, other leading Nazis that were helped to escape Europe by the Vatican itself? But talk about Mengele, please, and let us know if there's any further connections that you have or you can give us of the connection between the Vatican facilitating the escape of Nazis from Europe. Well, there is a there is a book that uh, Yuki Goni, my friend from South America, wrote about thousands of people escape uh, from uh, Europe by the help of the Vatican. I don't know uh, more examples about it, but I can tell you that uh, the Mossad, uh, the the head of Mossad, came with the, with the Mengele's address in Buenos Aires during the days that they, they needed to wait to El Al to land in Argentina to bring uh, Eichmann to Israel. Uh, they planned that uh, El Al will land after three days, three days after the capture. But because of a technical uh, problem, uh, El Al got a, a one week delayed. So that's why they needed to stay with Eichmann almost 10 days instead of three days. It was very long 10 days. So during these 10 days, the, the head of Mossad said, why don't we capture Mengele and bring him together with Eichmann? But uh, the other agents told him that it's a crazy idea because the mission is to bring only one Nazi. And it's very difficult to smuggle, to smuggle one person to the airport. So you want now to, to smuggle two persons to the airport in the same time. Doesn't make sense. So they decided to wait. And after Eichmann will land in Israel, they will try to locate, capture and smuggle Eichmann with a Zim ship. Zim, Z-I-M. It's a, a very big ship company, Israeli ship company. And for the capture of Eichmann, it was plan B. If something happened with the plan, they will bring him with the ship. So anyway, Ben-Gurion announcement in the Knesset was too early. Actually, because of his announcement, the Mossad needed to cancel the Mengele operation. And I believe, as far as I know, that Ben-Gurion didn't know about Mengele. He didn't know that the Mossad decided to uh, ask three agents to stay in uh, South America to bring Mengele. And I think that Israel decided not to tell him, the Israel, the head of Mossad, because Ben Gurion didn't want, as I said, to deal with the Nazis anymore. So it was like a, a small secret private operation to try to kill Mengele or to bring him also to Israel. 
And again, the three agents saw one day in a newspaper, they were in Brazil, they saw the picture of Eichmann on the main, a big picture of Eichmann on the main page of the newspapers, and they knew that the story is out and they have to escape back to Israel. Which is a pity. There's a lot of um, Jews who suffered because of Mengele, and it was a pity we missed an opportunity there. Um, I think this is a very important story. Um, soon, when we're filming this, a few days before in International Holocaust Memorial Day, but I don't think we have to wait for one specific day every year to remind ourselves of the Nazis and other Jew haters and how important it is for our Jews to have their day in court. Um, but Tim, just wrapping up, um, tell us something about the actual booth that um, Eichmann sat in in the court in Jerusalem. Where is that booth now? So this glass booth now is in a museum, a Holocaust museum in the north of Israel, in the Kibbutz Lochamea Getaot, the Ghetto Fighters Kibbutz. And uh, the famous uh, prosecutor from the trial, uh, from Eichmann's trial, uh, Gidon Hasner, decided to give this glass booth as a gift to the museum. But uh, when I made the exhibit uh, 11 years ago in the Mossad headquarters, and uh, Netanyahu asked me to come to the parliament, I decided also to come with the glass booth. So the glass booth came back to, from the kibbutz to Jerusalem. And then when we started to travel in the state, uh, we decided also to pay and to bring the, the original glass booth and it was one of the most uh, amazing uh, objects in the exhibit. And uh, we decided to build uh, a small courtroom that you can see it. And in the front of you, you'll see the glass booth and you'll see in the screen Eichmann's face. And you will see the witnesses in both sides in the very big screens. And you feel that you are part of the famous trial. So the trial was the second part of the Operation Finale exhibit. After a few years, the museum asked back because they uh, they needed the original glass booth for exhibit. So we uh, decided to build a replica of this uh, uh, glass booth and we continue to travel with the replica. All fascinating stuff. Uh, Avna, Avna Avram, I want to thank you for being our special guest today on a very important program. And I want to ask you if you please be my guest for another program where I would like you to tell us about the Spy Legends organization that you've created. And also please tell us about the Mossad role in Operation Entebbe. That was a role which led or uh, helped the Israelis to fly across into Africa and do the raid on Antebi and extract the Jewish passengers that were being held hostage, both by Palestinian and German terrorists protected by the Ugandan army. Uh, it's a fascinating story in itself, and I'd love you to be on the program and explain that to us as well. My pleasure. It will be my pleasure. Thank you, Abner Abraham. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you enjoyed this show. If you want to see this sh show again or uh, the next uh, video, please click the like button and also the subscribe button uh, so that you could have the, uh, the next uh, video that I do with uh, Mossad agent Abner Abraham of Spy Legends. Thank you for joining me. I'm Barry Shaw. This is The View from Israel. I'm not going to